and some service. And in the meantime, let's just go ahead and open it up in prayer while we're waiting on them to get it set up. Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to even be here to listen to your music and sing praise to you, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, you hear these prayer requests, both spoken and unspoken. We just pray, Lord, that you will have your will be done with them, Lord, and look after them, keep them safe. And we just pray for the service today, that you will fill this place with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And my first report this morning is for the surf team. This morning, I was like so excited to see a lot of people came early and um, come and join the surf team. And that is that has been our biggest um, prayer that that you know everybody to take you know to take their part for surf to serve God because you know I. I told somebody earlier this week about serving God. You know, everything that we can do in this world, that um, serving God is, it's just, you know, you can have a pure, a true peace. And that's just basically everything that you can do in life is just serve God, you know, and just like Amen. back to just serve God is just basically it's just everything so I praise the Lord that you know there's so many people this morning just get early and then get their time so early and then uh, to serve God this morning that's right That's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. I'll take along with me. I'll read and pray and then obey the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Stand alone on the word of God, the B I B L E. Bible. The B I B L E. I'll take along with me. I'll read and then obey the B I B L E. Bible. Woo! Let's hear for our All kids. Right. Are the kids getting settled in or their classes and the parents check them in? Why don't we just get up and stretch real quick so we, before we settle down and hear another great sermon? So stand up, greet your neighbor, and say hello. Did no. you say stand up and greet your neighbor? I said stand up. Stand not, up not and greet your neighbor. Stand up and stand up. Okay. Yeah. That takes speak. Worship together. Through you, the mute will sing. Through you, the dead will rise. Through you, all hearts will break. Through you, the darkness breaks.
free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Yes, Jesus. Who the Son sets free. looks like but if you can imagine being trapped held down in the bondage of chains of addiction of problems and everything else that the enemy wants to throw on you and for you to be set free to be taken out of that prison taken out of that place where you've been held down for so long I don't think you'd be doing this you'd be shouting a little bit, maybe jumping up and down, because I tell you what, when those prison doors were open, I ran and said, I'm free! I am free to run. I am free Come on, if you're free. Yes, I am free. I am free. Woo. Hallelujah. Make some noise for Jesus. I don't know about you. I've shared this testimony many, many times. I came from the country that, you know, I'm not free to sing as loud as I want. I'm not free. I was not free. And we had to whisper. We had to really, really quiet down whenever we go to church. And so whenever I move here, I'm going wild because, yes, because I can sing and I can shout and I can dance. You just don't know how it feels. Or you just don't know how it feels to be able to come to church and to have a loud music and to be able to just proclaim His name, Jesus Christ. And wearing this cross, I had to pay the price back then. So, guess what? I know how it feels to be free. And Amen. I don't care what you think. I'm dancing and I'm jumping around because the audience of one. That's right. My God, my Father, my Father. I Thank worship you, Him. I praise Him. Yes. And I know that my worship and my prayer and my praise to Him and it's worth of me. <laughs> going wild and Thank be you, free Jesus. to worship him and it's just I praise God I praise God and you know what one day and one day there's come the time in this country all that freedom will be taken away and we will be we will be a minority being a Christian that's right and while we are free to do that use it amen be free about worship God. You, Be Jesus. free about praising Him. Be free. Show everybody that you serve Jesus. That you are Jesus free. Just like me. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. If I can get my ushers to come forward just for a minute. I tell you. I went to my wife's church. When we went to Indonesia. And it was a. Uh, I think it was the pastor's house. And, and the living room had chairs on, on either side of, you know, an aisle down the middle. And, and when we sang, 
we had to sing like this, very quietly. Because if we offended the Muslim neighbors, they would shut down the church. They would burn down his house. They would run him off out of the community. You know, and so I've been there. I only visited there. You know, and I just want to tell you that, that we have a freedom in this country to worship our God, to honor him. And to not do so is absolute robbery to him and him alone. Worship takes on many forms, but I encourage you to give it all to him. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being here today. We thank you the honor of being able to worship freely to you, to sing, to dance, to shout, to be quiet and pray, to be connected to you. Lord, help us to honor you in word and deed. In Jesus' name, amen.
make some noise for Jesus. There's one thing about my Jesus, serving Jesus, is that I have hope in him. And I have victory in him. Yes, Jesus. And he is worthy. He's worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our worship. Because his love, it just his love is just so great. take over each one of us. Be patient, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, Lord God Almighty. 
wake up on a Sunday morning and you know that it's time for you to get ready to go to church and you just want to roll over and look at your spouse and say, I don't want to go. Have you ever been there? Never? That was my wife this morning. Couldn't tell it though. She got into worship, didn't she? Thank you, Jesus. She looked at me. She said, babe, do I have to go? Yes, you have to go, babe. (laughs) Yeah. We all have those days, right? You know, you just wake up tired and worn out and it's cold and you don't want to get out underneath the covers and all that kind of stuff yeah 
Yeah. So we have uh, did a series on our vision, on our core values. We've uh, backed it up with the, the need for uh, being a part and being a member of his church. Uh, we've talked a lot about what our goals are of, as a church are at the beginning of this year. And, and we really wanted to, to, to kind of just drive that point home as we started off this year. And I know like, hey, we're already, you know, we're already past the first of the year. But we've got, we've got a lot of work to do this year, don't we? Amen? Church, we got a lot of work to do this year, right? Because it's not just up to the pastor. It's not just up to a select few people. It's up to each and every one of us that consider ourselves a member of this church to, to be about his business, to be about the Father's business. And, and I kind of wanted to finish this, uh, this, all of this up and, and just kind of drive home this point again uh, with uh, the title of the sermon is, Do What I Do. Because we usually tell everybody, don't do what I do, do what I say, right? So we, we need to really make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do. So do what I do. Uh, so a man, he dies, he goes to heaven. Of course, St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates. And St. Peter says, here's how it works. In order to enter these pearly gates, you need to get 100 points to make it into heaven. You tell me the good things you've done, and I'll give you a certain number of points for each item, depending on how good it was. When you reach 100 points, you're in. What do y'all think about that? That seems like a, a fair course of action, huh? Well, okay, the man says, I was married to the same woman for 50 years and never cheated on her, not even in my heart. That's wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth three points. Hmm. Three points, he says. Well, I attended church all my life and supported his ministries with my tithes and service. Terrific, says St. Peter. That's certainly worth one point. One point? Golly, how about this? I started a soup kitchen in my city, worked in the shelter for homeless veterans, Fantastic. That's good for two more points, he says. Two points, a man cries. At this rate, the only way I'm going to get into heaven is by the grace of God. And St. Peter says, come on in. <laughs> Look, it is only by the grace of God that we're going to enter into heaven. Now, we've talked about this many times over. You can really get askewed skewed with, with good works, you know, because we're, we're supposed to be about good works. In fact, Scripture tells us he's all created a good work for us, you know, that there's something that we need to be doing. You know, but we can get askewed skewed with it that, that thinks that our, we can begin to think that our good works will earn our way into heaven. It is only by the grace of God that any of us are afforded the opportunity to have a relationship with the Father, to enter into heaven. But that being said, if... We have relationship with him if he resides in this, this structure, this, this, this house, then our life should begin to take on notice, to, to, to look like him, to do the things that he does, right? So today we're going to sum up all of this core training and membership covenant and all the other things that, we're, that we've been talking about, especially in our last part of our vision statement of impacting our world with love, truth, and grace into one predefined sentence. And it is simply this. That means to act like Christ, to behave like Jesus, to be Christ in this world to all those who are watching. So this requires two things. For those of you who like nice, neat sermons with, with two points or three points, today we have a two-point message for you. So you can take your notes. The first point being that we need to know, we need to know the character of Christ. If we're going to be Christ-like, we need to know Christ. We need to know his character. We need to know, we need to know what would Jesus do, Right? WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's the first thing we need to know. The second point is, is that we should live like Jesus lived. There's a difference between knowing something and doing it. Amen? Yeah. A lot of us think that just because we know something, we're okay. The reality is if you don't apply what you know, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. And so it, it isn't as much about what we know as it is what we do. Amen? In fact, how do we treat people? 
Now, how, how do we respond? You know, what I'm saying is Christianity is not just what you know. It's what you do, and it's how you love others. We're called to love. We're called to have compassion. We're called to be that example, that, that light in this dark world. And for those of you who were at, at the movie Friday night and watched Woodlawn, or maybe you've seen it already, you know, he, he told a story about Billy Graham shutting all the lights off in the stadium and, and lighting that one candle. And how that one candle then spread to everybody else that was in the stadium. And how, you know, it was so bright with all those that were there in attendance letting their light shine that, that the fire department was called because they thought something was on fire. And that's how we should be. Friends, that's what I wanted to be said about this church, about the people that come to this church. Whether you join or don't join, but if you attend this church, that, that we become a light in this world and a light that spreads to others. And Because it's not about what church you attend. It's not about where you put your tithes and offerings in. It's about serving God. It's about Him being number one in your life. It's about looking to resolve conflict by the Spirit of God. In fact, if we want the world to listen, then we've got to know how to live in a way that attracts them. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Many of you know this passage of Scripture, the, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, does anybody know, first and foremost, why it's referred to, these characteristics, why it's referred to as the fruit of of the Spirit. I've seen a hand come up over here. You're not going to be able to be heard, but go ahead and tell me and I'll repeat it. Don't tell me too much now. I can't remember all that. Okay. The result. My sister, for those who are watching online or be watching the DVD later, my sister says it's the result. The result of the change that happens inside. She said a bunch more stuff, but that was way past my ability to remember. So the result. You know, this is the reality. If you plant an orange tree, you get what? Oranges. That's the fruit, the evidence that you have an orange tree. You can tell me all day long that the tree planted in your front yard is an apple tree. If I don't see apples on it, I don't know that you're telling me the truth or not. Okay? But when I see apples on that tree... You know what I know that tree is? An apple tree. So the fruit of the Spirit is the characteristics, the characteristics of Christ, the characteristics of having the Spirit within you, the fruit, the evidence, the results of the fact that Jesus is inside of you. So let's go on. Let's read this passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now I want to go back and look at these. The first one was love. Love. You know, in our society, we have a hard time understanding what the word love means. My kids really get it messed up. Okay? Now my wife tries to keep it in perspective because they'll be like, I love pizza. And she'll say, what, you want to get married to pizza and have little pepperonis running around or what, you know? I mean, that's not love. You really like pizza. You don't love pizza. And so we have a tendency to water down words and their meaning. But, but if we go to the heart of the meaning of the word love and understand this is agape love. This, is, this, 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 this love is, uh, is, is, is huge. In fact, it's surprising that most Christians... Uh, it's not surprising that we understand that most Christians are supposed to be loving, right? And so when we look at the definition of, of the word love, it, it says it means to love, to cherish, to esteem. I like this part. To impart confidence. And, and what that means to me is like my children. My children know I love them. Even if I get upset with them, they know I love them. They're confident that no matter what they do, no matter how bad they mess up, no matter you know, how many times I've hollered and fussed and screamed and threatened to whoop them or whatever else you know, that we as parents do for the things that they've done, they have such a confidence in the love that I have for them, they know that I'm not going to turn my back on them. Parents, you understand that kind of love, right? 
And, and so that's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of love that he's talking about. He's talking about a love that imparts confidence, a love that expresses goodwill. God's love gives us confidence. In fact, Romans 10 and 13 says, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's confidence. That's agape love right there. That's the love, the characteristic that is the fruit of the spirit that should be within us, that this world and this community should see is a love that imparts confidence that everyone, not some, not only the good ones, not only those that, you know, are a blessing to you, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say might be saved. See, that's confidence. Confidence to know. And friends, I want to tell you something. When the fruit of the Spirit begins to, to take over your life and you begin to understand the love that God has for you, the fact that he's willing to do whatever it takes for you to be found, Think about that. He's willing to snatch the rug out from underneath your feet so that you fall flat on your face and you got nowhere to look but look up. Amen? He loves you that much. He loves you enough to, to not let you stay in your misery, but to put people in your path to, 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 to draw you out of that. He loves you that much. That love, when you understand that love, it will impart such a confidence to you that you'll be able to walk with your head held high regardless of where you've been in your past and the things you've done. Because God Almighty loves you. Think about that. If that doesn't give you confidence to attack this world and the things of this world and, and life itself, life can throw you some curveballs. I'm telling you. I have got friends and people that are in my life and times in my own life that I've been through things and you wonder, What's next? Does it stop? And you go, how come, Lord, this is going on and you don't have the answers and you wish you could sprinkle some magic fairy dust over it, make it all okay, but it doesn't seem to change no matter how you pray or what you ask. And life can be hard. And that's when you need to know God's love all the more so that you can stand in confidence to know that he is God. He is in charge. And he loves you. And no matter what you're going through this morning, he has your best interest at heart. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's God's love. It says, when he became Lord, uh, his love gives us confidence to know that he is our God and we are his people. That's the kind of love we're talking about. Then the next fruit of the Spirit after love was joy. Again, we're talking about the characteristics that we as a church, we as a people who love the Lord, should be expressing to this community. Amen? Amen. Love being the first one. Joy. Joy is a very interesting word. Joy. It, it means gladness of heart. This kind of joy exists in any situation. It, it, when things are going your way, it's easy to be happy. Amen, right? Amen. It, and, and when you're happy, it seems to easy, easy for you to express joy, right? Because, you know, things are going your way. It's easy to be happy, you know? Like, you walk around with a smile on your face, and everybody's like, how are you doing? I'm great. God is good. Yeah. Well, what about when things aren't going your way? Is God's goodness changed? No. It, when things aren't going your way, do, do, does your demeanor change? Does your, do, does, your, does your level of the way in which you express your joy change? Should it change? My sister said, yes, but no, it shouldn't. <laughs> okay. Yes, it does. Yeah, that's our human nature. It does get in the way, doesn't it? But it shouldn't change. And so the source of our joy has got to be our Lord, our relationship with him. So here's something I've always been uh, adamant about. If the world doesn't give it to you, the world can't take it away. In other words, if my peace, if my joy, if my sense of belonging comes from God Almighty and my relationship with him, then Nothing and no one can take it. 
If my joy comes from the fact that I got a good paying job, what happens when I don't have that good paying job? It's gone. If my joy comes from the fact that I have a, a good relationship with my spouse, what happens when we're at odds with one another? Because if you're married, you know what's going to happen eventually, right? <laughs> All the married people are like, amen. Yeah. Only the ones that were sitting further than at arm's length away from their spouse, because otherwise they're going to get the elbow. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Yeah. Anyways, if the world doesn't give it to you, the world can't take it away. Now, I know we all have our moments, and it's easy when everything's going right to talk about having the joy of the Lord and having that be your strength and, you know, and understanding that it, you know, it comes from your relationship with God. It's all easy to say, right? You know, but it's much harder to do when you're in the midst of a sickness and you're in the midst of you losing your job or you've been in a car accident, you lost your transportation. You know, it can get very difficult to, to stay connected to the source of your joy. And so I'm not saying that we won't get down. But I'm saying we've got to know who we belong to. Friends, I, I, I just got to share this with you. If you live to be 100 years old on this earth, and you live in complete misery, always wanting, never having, always looking, always seeking, but never finding. If that were to be the case, if you were never to experience what the world would consider to be a joyous occasion in your life, that hundred years is still nothing but the drop in a bucket to eternity with Christ. We have got to understand what we're living for, who we belong to, and the reason for our existence. The reason for our existence isn't for us to be happy, isn't for us to get what we want. You won't hear no prosperity gospel messages in this church because you know what? Sometimes you just don't get it. Sometimes you do. God is not any less good when you ain't got as when you do have. He's still good. But the reality is, when you know who you belong to, you know what he's done for you. You know what he wants to do with you. That ought to bring some joy. That ought to give you some resolve to continue on. The, the next word there says, so we talked about love. We talked about joy. Let's go back to the scripture. It says, peace. Now, Peace is kind of the same idea as joy on the fact that it doesn't come from your outward circumstances. It's got to come from your relationship. And the Greek word there is, I'm not going to say it right, but erne. Er, er, it denotes a sense of undisturbed well-being. Here's the reality. If you don't know the prince of peace on an intimate personal relationship, you don't know peace. Friends, I'm telling you something. If we're going to be those people, if our lives are going to change, if we're not going to do the same thing we've always done and continue to get the same thing we've always got, we've got to allow the Spirit of God to come into us and change us from the inside out. Our purpose, our meaning for life has got to be totally transformed. We've got to seek Him in order to find Him. And when we do, the love that comes from that relationship will be there. The joy will be there. The peace will be there. And like I said, it's very similar to joy in the fact that it doesn't come from without, but what's from within. The best way that I can simply know peace is to know he's in charge. He's God. Whatever you're facing today. Whatever is trying to steal your peace today, you need to look it in the eye, look yourself in the eye, look in the mirror, whatever you got to do and go, he's God, I'm not. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I am yours. I belong to you. You are my supplier and I'm looking to you to meet my needs. That is when you'll find peace. And trust me, peace in the storm doesn't mean the storm stops. Sometimes it's raging all around you. Sometimes it's raging all around you. But nonetheless, there's peace here. We'll go on. It says, uh, 
love and joy and, and peace and, and, and can we skip this word? Should we skip this word? Does anybody want to skip this word? Patience, right? How many of y'all ever had somebody tell you don't pray for patience? Okay, I see a few hands going up. And why do they say don't pray for patience? Because you're going to get tested, right? You know, you're, there's going to be some stuff that happens. I, don't, I think that's a farce. I think we should pray for patience. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, and we need all the fruit we can get. Amen? Amen. By the way, for all you who think that eating vegetables and eating fruit is going to help you on your diet, just look at the rhinoceros and the elephant and the baboon. That's all they eat is fruit and vegetables. Going back to the fruit of the Spirit, amen? <laughs> Patience is a characteristic that, well, our society just doesn't want. I, I remember as a child growing up, I'm going to chill my age right now, when microwaves first came out. Do you remember when microwaves first hit the market? I remember that. Well, I remember the first one we got. I don't know if it was the first one they first hit the market, but the first one that we got in our house, yeah. It was attached to a stove over the top of it. Y'all seen those? They come in one unit, right? And, and, and microwaves were great. Man, you could do all kinds of stuff in a microwave. It was like having instant food, you know? I remember when you used to make popcorn, you'd stick it in there, you'd turn the dial on, and you'd listen for it to pop. Pop, 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 pop. And you'd have to wait till you had the space in between it to stop it just at the right time so that you didn't have burnt popcorn. You know what I'm talking about? No, you don't. Y'all don't know that because y'all are younger. Y'all got microwaves that got popcorn buttons on it. You just throw the bag in, hit the popcorn button, come back, and it's perfect. That's because we got no patience. Back in the day when I was growing up, we had patience. We had to listen to it pop. Pop, 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 pop. You go to the drive-thru and you have to wait more than five seconds for your food. You're fussing. What's wrong with them? Can't get my order right, man. I'm in here 15 seconds. <laughs> Back in the day, they used to have to go kill the cow and ground it up, and then make a hamburger. <laughs> Talking about all day to get a hamburger, you know? Forget baking the bread just to get the bun. I mean, you had to let it rise and then knead it back down, let it rise. Come on, we don't know what patience is. <sighs> but it's one of the characteristics we're supposed to have. Patience, uh, uh, if we have patience, we'll start trying to fix things that only God can fix. Come on now. I, I figured I'd get an amen on that. How many of y'all try to fix what only God can fix? Oh, y'all am not being honest. This is church. You know what happens to liars in church? <laughs> Same thing happens to liars anywhere else, okay? Don't worry about it. <laughs> we all need forgiveness, Amen. <laughs> Somebody's going, is that in the Bible if you lie in church? Oh, my gosh. You know? <laughs> now, look, we all get in the midst of trying to fix what only God can fix. We need his hand in our life. We need him to fix it. We need to learn patience. It, it, it means to wait, to suffer, to have the ability to change the situation but refrain from doing so, to hold your temper for a long time. Think about this. I can promise you, I can prove to you that patience is one of the greatest fruits of the Spirit. Besides all the others, because they're all equal. Okay? When Christ was on the cross, he expressed a huge amount of patience. If patience means the having the ability to change the situation, but not doing so. He had been beaten. His flesh had been torn. His beard had been ripped out. They were spat on him. They mocked him. You know what? I had almost rather have somebody beat me up than mock me. Because when you mock me, it just makes me want to prove something to you. You know what I mean? Just, you, ever, you ever been there? Just like, oh, yeah. You know what? I deal with it a lot, but I'm fixing to show you something. You know? I mean, but Jesus didn't do that. He could have said when they said, if you're the son of God, then end all this down. You know, come down from that cross and end it right now. He could have wiped us all out. He could have stepped down off that cross. But he had patience to wait on God the Father's plan to be fulfilled 
in not only his life, but our lives. And friends, I want to tell you something, that that is a fruit of the Spirit that we need. We need to ask for it. We need to pray for it. We need to recognize that we may have the ability to change the situation that we're in. We may have the ability to, to move our address, to change our job, to, 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 to change our spouse, whatever it may be. You may have that physical ability to do something about it. But the reality is you need to take some patience to wait on God to fulfill what only He can do. You change spouses, you may find a worse one than what you had to begin with. Amen? Yeah. See, we live in a world with no patience. We need patience. The next one uh, after patience is kindness. And, and it is defined as usefulness, a grace that pervades the whole nature. See, this isn't just being kind sometimes. This is being kind in a way that is useful to the people around us. Have any of y'all ever met somebody kind? I hope so. Y'all know me. Y'all better raise your hand now. Come on. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, maybe I'm not kind enough. Uh, we, need, we need to be kind in such a way that it's useful to people. First John 3 and 18. Can you pull that up for us? First John 3 and 18. William. William's asleep. Wake up, William. First John 3 and 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth so you can tell somebody all day long oh, you you love them but are you praying for them are you doing what you can do to to try to impact their life now some people won't let you impact their life I'm sorry they just won't you try they won't let you but that doesn't mean you don't stop praying for them you don't stop seeking you don't stop asking in other words we're not supposed to just talk about helping people we're supposed to actually help them. So we can come in here all day long and, and repeat that vision statement, impacting our world with love, truth, and grace, meeting the needs of our community, impacting our world with love, truth, and grace. But if we're not actually going out there and doing something about it, are we really making a difference? And again, I, I keep trying to press the point that it's not just my responsibility. It's not just the leadership's responsibility to do that. It's each and every one of our responsibilities to do that. I met with somebody this week. They rode to the hospital with me, and we got a chance to go pray for somebody together. Man, that was a blessing. That was a blessing. And on the way back, they said, hey, why don't we get together and meet one day? We can go out and knock on some doors and pray for people. I said, people still do that? He said, oh, yeah. So if you're interested in going out and meeting sometime during the week and knocking on doors, pray for people, you know, we should get together and do that. But I really like this one pastor I've seen uh, that he's got it down pat, man. I wish we had a place around here where he could do that, but uh, he's got it. He goes to the coffee shop like Starbucks. He orders him a cup of coffee and he sets out a card and it says, free prayer. And he sits there and he waits for everybody to come by and pray for them, whatever they may need. You know, it gets to meet their needs. Wow. That's where I want to go. <laughs> you know, But no, we got to get out there. We got to do something about it. And let me tell you something. Prayer is powerful. It is the most powerful weapon we have against the enemy. There's nothing you can do better than God. Oh, that took some of you by shock. But I'm the hands and the feet. Yes, you are. You still got to be connected to the source. In order to be able to do anything. So we got to be kind. we got to do something. Your church that you're involved in here. Not only has an outreach to help those who may, who may be homeless. Or have substance abuse issues. We have a sewing assistance program. Uh, hospitality teams. By the way I'm so proud of, your, of our congregation. Y'all give them a hand. We have more and more individuals stepping up on the serve team. In fact, we were actually able to give off a couple that has never had a day off on the serve team since they joined. And they looked at me like, did I get fired? No, you didn't get fired. It's just a day off, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, it was great because we have people stepping up. And, and one of the things we're really excited about is, is we have like three or four more people stepping up in the kids program next door. Do you know we have a huge kids ministry here? I mean, we do. Sometimes it's larger than others, but that's the way things go. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But you know what? This kid-friendly church thing that we're doing, by the way, next week's kid-friendly church, I encourage you to invite all of your friends that have, you know, grade school age children to attend. It's going to be great. When we say Jesus is going to be here, he's going to be here. 
We're going to nail him to that cross. The Jesus, he's sitting in our congregation right now. He's thinking, are you going to do what to me? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to nail him to the cross. It's going to be great, you know. Uh, we're not going to make it bloody because it's going to be young kids here. Don't worry. Like, it won't be tragic. And he's going to take all of our problems with him to the tomb, which will be over there. Because that's exactly what Christ did. He took all of our sins, all of our problems, all of our storms in life that we face, and, and he took them to the tomb with him, and he defeated them. And, and that's what's going to be happening next week. I encourage you to invite all, all, all the kids that you know, families that you know, to be a part of this. We, we do these things. We have a food bank. We have clothing assistance, a donation-based lawn care, handyman service. That's just some of the stuff that we do as the organization. That doesn't include what, all the stuff that you guys are doing out there. You know, and, and who you're talking to and who you're meeting. That's being kind. The, the next one after kindness, it says we have the fruit of spirits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Goodness. Now, I have, to, I have to be honest with you. Goodness is a little harder to define than the rest of them. And we talked about this on Wednesday for those of you who are here. Because some of us have a different moral compass of what's good and what's not good. And so because good can be such a variable word... We've got to go to Scripture to define it. We cannot define it based on what we think is good. You know, I may think that my children getting a hundred on the report card is good. You may think your child getting a sixty-nine on the report card is good. You know, uh, there's there. It could be relative. Oh, my kid's doing good in school. Well, you know what? Each child's different. You know. The child that's doing his best to get a 69 may be just as good as the child that's doing their best to get a 100. Good can be relative. So we've got to know what God defines as good. What's the greatest commandment? Come on, church. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, and soul. And the second commandment is like it. Love thy neighbor as thyself, right? So goodness can be summed up within Scripture as loving God first and foremost, and then others as much as you care for yourself. Then why are we so self-centered and selfish most of the time? Why? I mean, if our ultimate goal is to bring God glory and honor and love Him first, and then our second goal in goodness is to love others as much as we love ourselves, then how come we miss the mark so often? I would venture to say that we haven't got the first one down packed. We fail to really realize how significant God is. It's like we come to church... We believe, I believe everybody here is a believer. You're here in church. You believe that he is Lord, he's God, and he can do anything. But yet you sit there and you go out and you try to do everything on your own without even seeking his advice. We've got to get to the point where he's God. We know he's God. He's in charge. And we know he's in charge. And we ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? You may be surprised he tells you nothing. Just stand back out the way and let me do it. And there's other times he may tell you, go dig a ditch. You know? He may go tell you, go pray for somebody. He may tell you, give what money you got in your pocket to the person sitting beside you. See, I didn't say up here to me. I wasn't talking about me, you know? To whoever. He may tell you anything. But you need to be obedient to him. That's goodness. The, the next one here in the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness means obedience to the faith. Faith is an action word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and yet not seen. Faith. Well, what is our, where, where is our faith? Faithfulness is, is to actually live in accordance to what we say we believe. 
And, and I keep going back to this again and again and again and again. And, and many of you are going to be like, well, I don't really like today's sermon. But that's okay because there's really only one major point. He's God. He's God. You're not. He's God. You're not. I'm not. He's God. He's in charge. He owns you. If you've given your life to him, he owns you. Why do you think Paul referred to himself as a, a bond servant, a slave, one that was owned, one that had no will of his own anymore, but to live in accordance to what God wants him to do? Church, if we're going to impact this world for him, we've got to live like he did. He gave everything for you. Can I let you in on a little secret? He gave everything for me. You know what? I know I don't deserve it. I'm a human being. I fall short. I have problems. I get mad. I get agitated. I, I, you know, I fall to some old habits from time to time. Whatever it may be, that's who we are. We don't deserve it, yet he gave his life anyways so that we could find freedom in him. If we're going to live like him, we should be willing to lay down our lives for others that are beside us, others that we'll meet that don't deserve it. That's what he did. I, I, most amazing thing to me is this, I, I, and I have a hard time wrapping my mind around it. I know you're going to be like, how you can't understand that? I'm sorry, it's just hard for me to really grasp. I know it's true, and, and I believe it wholeheartedly, but it's hard for me to grasp is how he can love me so much, knowing every mistake I'd ever make, and he still chose to die for me anyways. It's hard for me to grasp because in my humanness, I can understand laying down my life for somebody that's going to appreciate it. But it's hard for me to grasp me giving up my own life, my own wants, my own desires, my own, my own authority and power in heaven as he did to somebody who's going to reject the very gift that I've given them. That's love. And friends, that's what we're called to love like. And, 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 and that's joy and that's peace and that's patience and that's kindness and goodness and that's faithfulness. Being demonstrated. Faithfulness, living according to the faith that enables gentleness. Did you know faithfulness will enable gentleness, which is the next word? Gentleness. Gentleness. <sighs> it can be hard to be gentle sometimes, isn't it? I mean, sometimes you can find it real easy, but... Like after you've already talked to somebody and talked with them and prayed with them and, you know, and then they do it again and then you talk with them and you pray with them and they do it again and you talk with them and pray with them and you do it again. It gets a point where, you, you know, you're not so sure that, you know, wouldn't be gentle, you know. Uh, you know how to be gentle. It's difficult. Gentleness. But our faithfulness to God will produce the gentleness that we need to impact this world. Friends, if you even get serious and seriously understand, there are people that are going to die and go to hell. A very real place for eternity. We might get a little more oomph in us to go out and try to reach those that are lost. To be gentle with them. It's an attitude of spirit by which we accept God's dealings with us as good and do not dispute or resist. You know, sometimes God has a way of disciplining us. Amen. Sometimes that discipline isn't pleasant. In fact, most of the time when you're getting disciplined, it's not pleasant. It's not something you want, but it's for our benefit. Sometimes we lose things that we think are devastating to us, but it was really the best thing that ever happened to us to be able to lose that thing. That, that's gentleness. You know, that's what we've got to understand. That not despising how God deals with us is us operating in gentleness. See, when you're going through hardships, we need to look for 
transformation that God wants us to do and allow to happen. And when we learn how to do that and how to be gentle before the Lord to accept what He sends our way and not fight either with Him or the people around us, then we'll develop this last word, which I want to go over the fruit of the Spirit as we get ready to close, self-control. It means one, holding control or holding one in temperance. It means when we learn how to control ourselves in a situation rather than the situation controlling us. I'm going to call the praise team up here real quick as we get ready to, to close. Self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the evidence that God lives within us. It's that we're filled with love, that we're filled with joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a journey that he's called us to. And, And... Again, the the point of this message is for us who believe to recognize who he is, who he is in our lives, what he's done for us, and what he's called for us to do for others. If I could have everybody just bow their head. And close your eyes. Father, we just, we love you. We love you, Jesus. And I know there's many times in my own life that the evidence of you and me is hard to see. For that, I repent. I want to be a a, a vessel that is filled up by your presence and your glory. Because I want to be a light in this dark world that makes a difference in the lives that you send my way. So I ask you, Lord, remove the things that are a barrier to your presence. And fill me with your spirit. If you feel that that prayer belongs to you I just want you to slip your hand up and then quickly put it back down yes I see you yes 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 friends today as we close I'm going to ask for every believer here to get serious about your purpose in life. To stop doing the things you've always done just because you've always done them. But to look for a way that you can reach out to the lost that are here. Look for a way that you can meet the needs in your community and impact your world with love, truth, and grace. Will you stand with me? Let today be a day of commitment for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your fruit. We thank you for the evidence of your life in us. And Lord, as as many of those raise their hand to to pray the same prayer that I'm praying, Lord God, that you would become more and we would become less. Let us impact this world for you. In Jesus' name, the altar is open. Will you come?